Hello, everyone. This is Shaina Silva. I'm here with my co-host, Daniel Silva, and this is Haiti Prosperity Podcast. In the last episode, we did a little bit of a verbal simulation of what the worst case scenario for Haiti would be if we were to continue in the current state that we are in today. We talked about this growing sense of pessimism and lack of trust in the institutions and how those different factors are really affecting our ability to have a sense of trust in our leadership, in our institutions, in each other, to have a sense of safety and security operating in a country like Haiti, and how just those two elements alone create a sense or are, are a major friction point for even reaching a point of setting in place necessary infrastructure for prosperity. These things have to exist before we can really get into a stage of setting ourselves up for prosperity. We ended the episode with a few potential scenarios and outcomes that could happen if we were to continue to go down that negative path. But in this episode, I want to talk about resilience. When you are, or when a country is in a very fragile state and not performing, not able to serve its people in a state of chaos and turmoil, a lot of outsiders have actually described Haiti as a country, uh, as a country that has people who have always been so resilient in the face of adversity. I think this word came up the most in 2010 in the aftermath of the earthquake when the world watched the news and what was happening when the country was essentially flattened. And the word that was used the most was the, the word resilient, how Haitians are such a resilient people. I want to dissect that a little bit because in previous conversations, Dad, we've talked about what does resilience actually mean? And do we have that? That is an excellent question because I've heard uh, this uh, association of resiliency in Haiti many times as well. And it's disconcerting to, to, you know, to put those words uh, and associate, associate that with, with a nation without really defining what such a word means, because if you are going to associate it with a nation, it, it's better be, there better be a clear definition of uh, uh, resilience uh, or Haiti, Haiti with um, resiliency. Resilience is the ability to quickly recover from a difficult situation, as simple as a definition that can be. Quickly, being able to quickly recover from a difficult situation. And that comes with the idea of bouncing back, of returning to normal, of picking up where we left off. Um, before whatever difficulty or challenge we experienced. In the context of the 2010 earthquake, for example, which was a devastating uh, event that took place in the country, uh, we have not quickly recovered from that. And when we say we, Port-au-Prince itself, because that's where the major uh, the impact uh, took place. We have not quickly, or have we not, we have not recovered at all <laughs> from uh, such an event. And we are today in 2022, uh, it, that's 12 years later. And I don't think we've even started recovering or working on recovering. So there is no resiliency in that 
uh, sense. Um, so in order to take strategic actions to build resilience, it's, it's, it's important, I think, that decision makers, the, you know, the politicians, the private sector, and the international community, uh, the, those decision makers, they have to understand what resiliency is. You know, as a country, we cannot afford to be passive and wait for things to happen to us. We need to understand our vulnerabilities. So we've never really have an inventory of vulnerabilities, as we've been talking about inventory. Um, and, and, and once we understand our vulnerabilities uh, and preempt challenges before they arise, ensure we are prepared for them and mitigate the impacts. Then, when events do occur, we should be ready to withstand and recover. And that's what those simulations that we talked about in the previous session uh, allow you to do. In other words, you, you, you can foresee vulnerabilities, you can identify them, and you can preempt uh, you know, the, the, the challenges before they arise and have the proper infrastructure, the proper resources that would help you quickly recover. It's not just recovering, but quickly recover, bounce back. We don't have that. Yet. So the resiliency notion is something that needs to be redefined as far as we are concerned. Wow. So if I understand what you're saying, this narrative that really mostly the international media has, in a very paradoxical way, describing Haitians as resilient while also describing Haiti as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So you guys are really poor, but you're so resilient in your poverty. Um, <laughs> kind of is a misleading narrative. So that's the first thing to really address is when we talk about when Haiti is talked about in, in the global marketplace and in, in the global landscape of conversations, the two things that often come up is poorest country in the Western hemisphere and oh, how resilient these people are to, with, to continue to live under these circumstances. But what you're saying is that this is not resilience. This is resignation. That, absolutely. And in, in Bon Jean Creole, c'est pas résilience, c'est résilier. That's correct. And what you're saying also, where I'm capturing that you're saying, is that resilience means that you're able to bounce back from really difficult situations and in most cases bounce back even better than where you were before. And if we use the example of the earthquake, not only did we not bounce back better than before, we are today in a worse state than we were in 2010, 2009, 2008, and the years that preceded. So in summary, we cannot really describe ourselves as resilient. Now, you said something else. You said that there are actually strategies to help us become resilient. And this can come from having a simulation of what resilience will look like, which means simulating the environmental impacts of the country, simulating the economic shocks of the country, simulating the political um, polarizations of the country and, and what that could look like and what needs to be put in place in order to withstand the shocks that could happen so that if we start to even trickle into the direction of a worst case scenario, we can veer to the left and place ourselves in a better scenario for a more prosperous future. So this whole idea of simulation, in order to really build that resiliency, is critical. It is indeed critical. 
Resiliency is not a cultural activity. <laughs> it's something that you plan. <laughs> you have to plan resiliency. And if you're planning resiliency, you have to develop a national strategy. So, you know, for Haiti, in order for Haiti to develop such a strategy, it would have to develop its ability to anticipate, to assess, to prevent, to mitigate and respond to, recover from known, unknown, direct, indirect, emerging risks. So when you are talking about resiliency, you have to have an inventory of vulnerabilities and risks and look at those two elements and break, you know, the, uh, being able to assess, have an inventory of such vulnerabilities because that's exactly, those are exactly the, the vulnerabilities that you, that you are going to prevent uh, and, and work toward recovering from such risks. So what kind of risks are we talking about here? We are talking about environmental hazards, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, which are known vulnerabilities. It's not something that we get surprised about every year, but they come. And they come very strongly. And they come in specific areas of the country so why not in work in seasons and sometimes a couple of times a year uh, other risks are human animal uh, health risks because sometimes we go through major health epidemic or pandemic cholera covid other sorts of you know, including other diseases that are known to be, um, you know, vulnerabilities uh, within the country, major accidents, uh, societal risks, uh, you know, those youth uh, within certain neighborhoods that have, you know, so much energy, but that uh, are not supported by society in general, uh, or even malicious attacks from foreign powers because you are a country you have neighbors you have competitive neighbors so you have to um you know uh, foresee potential uh, malicious attacks on the part of uh, such uh, neighbors so that encompass those risks have domestic sources internally and they have uh, roots from foreign powers as we were saying so known risks that we have earthquake uh, hurricanes they are clearly identified tsunamis some uh, is, a, is a risk within haiti uh, epidemic food and security is a clear risk uh, in the country unfair economic competition with our neighbors um, public funding, because we don't collect enough taxes to fund some of our programs, including resiliency. <laughs> and nowadays, cybersecurity is something that we need to, it's a risk within the country. Recently, I know that a couple of banks got hacked. Uh, and um, in Haiti, and one of them uh, spent, oh, two of them spent a, about a week without uh, normal, um, you know, operating <laughs> environment. And they were not that resilient because one week for a bank not to be operating properly is a bank that's not resilient. So that's... Uh, so resilience is at all levels of society. It's not just the government having a plan for creating a resilient nation, but even at the level of the private sector, we are not resilient. Because if a bank cannot bounce back in less than a week, you have underserved customers whose identity, whose information, personal information have been compromised through a cyber attack. And it's taking you a week plus to bounce back. 
and we don't know if they've actually bounced back. It's still TBD. No, they are. They are. They're operating. working towards. They yeah, working. they are. No, they are operating fully now. But a week is a long. A time week is the, a very the, long the time. System. And, and and the reputation of those institutions uh, has been uh, affected by that, and you know potentially customers could uh, want to take uh, their funds from such institutions and move uh, such funds in other <laughs> in a more secure, trustworthy uh, institutions. So this is this is very interesting because. First of all, the whole idea of deconstructing resilience and for us to be able to be realistic with ourselves, we cannot continue to tell ourselves it's fine if the foreign person who has romanticized Haiti in a way can say, oh, they're so resilient in the face of poverty that they've been living under for 200 years. They have romanticized our poverty, but ourselves as Haitians, we have to be realistic. We have not built infrastructure, systems, processes to actually live this resilience. And in order for us to really get there, there needs to be a strategic plan to assess and inventory the risks, as you said, the risks and the vulnerabilities, whether it is environmental, health-related, human factor-related, societal, animal even, Plants. right? Plants. We have to have an inventory of those vulnerabilities, of those risks, and be able to design a plan that will ensure that whenever any of these things are compromised, that we'll be able to bounce back. We don't have that today. We don't. We don't. However, we need to build. We need to build such uh, infrastructure. And I would say it's a, it's a major endeavor for a country to build resiliency. And I, I would suggest that it would be something that needs to be built city by city on a per city situation. Uh, why cities? Uh, because cities play a key role as centers of economic activity, opportunity, and innovation. But there are also places where stresses accumulate and sudden shocks occur. In the case of Port-au-Prince, you've seen what that uh, led to. And due in part to, because of concentrated resource use and human population uh, in, in cities, exacerbated by issues such as urbanization, and, and, and the, the tragedies of the commons. Uh, so these stresses and shocks uh, can potentially result in social breakdown, which we have in Port-au-Prince right now, uh, physical collapse in the cities, economic deprivation. And on, uh, unless the city is, is resilient, you will have those uh, elements. And, uh, Port-au-Prince is a very good illustration of a non-resilient uh, city. So it's unfortunate, but at least we know what uh, we have. Um, so in, in Haiti, cities are, are fast growing. Uh, the majority of growth in the country continues to be in informal settlements. You have all those different uh, uh, settlements uh, throughout uh, uh, Martissan, Jalousie, Cité Soleil. Those are informal settlements. Uh, and it's practically because of infrastructure maintenance and development. It cannot keep up with urban population uh, growth uh, in the country. And it's primarily an issue of affordability in that many of those moving into the city 
or forming new independent households within the city cannot afford land, property, or rental prices in the formal economy. So that's why you have those informal uh, settlements. So it's, 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 so the, the cities in Haiti have a great need for increased resilience and, uh, and such resilience would be to connect the formal with the informal. And that, that's, that might be a way to, to, to create you know, a synergy between the formal and the informal, which will lead to resiliency. So what I like about what you just said is that the resiliency planning doesn't have to be a behemoth plan that feels almost impossible because it's at the country level. If we were to tackle it at the city level, whether it's Capaïcien, Gonaïve, Port-au-Prince, Jérémy, Lecai, especially those cities that are becoming overpopulated because the rural population is moving into them in hopes of finding better quality of life and access to education and resources and jobs, which is creating pressure in those cities, which is then adding to the insecurity in those cities and the stress on the infrastructure and the services that exist. If we were to create resiliency plans per, per city, then those cities would have a custom plan that is designed for them, not a high level 300,000 foot view of what could happen, but a custom plan for Cap Haitien, a custom plan for Gonaive, a custom plan for Port-au-Prince based on how the city is structured today and the inventory of risks and vulnerabilities of that city particular that that particular city that resiliency plan is more likely to succeed because it is addressing exactly what the city faces what the city needs and where the city could be if we were to build that plan around those risks tout à fait <laughs> As cities are interacting systems with the people, the land, the formalities, the regulations, security, finance, ports, public health, uh, waste management, you have to think of a city as a system of systems. An ecosystem an ecosystem and to manage an ecosystem you have to have an approach of systems thinking so it has so the planning has to take place in 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 a system thinking mindset in other words you have the ministry or, or maybe the municipality and the finance and the waste management folks the, public health area, all of these have to understand their roles and actually know what they need to play as a role in terms of in, in the resiliency plan and the interaction that they have to uh, have with the other systems. So it's not just uh, being competent internally, but having the proper channels of communications with the other systems. So that's why we are talking about the system thinking. And once you build that, you, you start understanding the roles that would bring resiliency. And you would start understanding also the vulnerabilities and being able to reinforce them uh, within the systems of systems. Go ahead. So I was just going to interject a little bit because in the world of technology, um, systems thinking is a really important part of how we build products. 
right? It's we we call it design thinking uh, for the most part, and this is really done by looking at the needs of your customer base or the the target customer, and where those needs are not being filled, create a either a competitive advantage if it does not yet exist in the market or an opportunity for something completely new that has never been created that you will now create to satisfy or fulfill that need. Um, so just in the world of technology, creating the parallel that we also do a sort of design thinking when we're building products, because that's how you solve problems is by thinking about it in a design oriented way or with a system <laughs> in a system oriented way, because design is a system. Is it is is an elaborate system. Things are connected to each other. And if you're able to really design these interconnections, then you will have a solid roadmap, a plan, and a way to execute something that can actually give fruit. Another consideration in building resiliency is knowledge. So you get knowledge flowing. Um, cities that practice learning by doing, which is what simulations give you the chance to practice, you can reflect, you can record lessons learned, you can effectively integrate them back into the planning. So it's a, it's a virtual, uh, it's a, it's a virtuous uh, cycle where you you are always uh, perfecting what you've built. Uh, so that's the knowledge flowing that I'm referring to. Uh, that's very important uh, in uh, building resiliency. Uh, and you you one even needs to run emergency drills at times, uh, particularly emergencies that are related to the that are related to the known vulnerabilities and risks so you run drills around them that's why sometimes uh, here in the us uh, in other places uh, they run emergency fire drills in buildings uh, it's to see how people would react and the amount of time it would take to evacuate people to um put uh, you know get the uh, fire trucks in place and you know yeah. turn off the, the the fire yeah no definitely and i think with this concept of systems thinking, just to bring it back a little bit to the world of technology where we really look at design thinking and the different stages of design thinking, it starts with empathizing. That having empathy around your people or your customers is the first step in actually the design process. So you're not designing based off, on, based off of your personal interest, your personal ideas, your personal agenda, but you're empathizing with the people that you're actually trying to serve for. The second stage in the design thinking process is defining. So once you've empathized and you understood the needs, then you define what it is that can actually help to solve those needs. And then you start ideating. What are some of the solutions that we can actually build to solve this defined problem that we've identified? And then you prototype, right? There has to be a testing or a simulation of the solution. You don't just roll it out and think that's it, leave it behind and hope it works. You have to prototype it and then test it to see if it works. You do that through drills. Drills. And you get lessons learned lessons from learned from drills. those drills and, and build it document back it. document it and build it back into the solution so that you have something that is actually feasible tangible usable and and can give you practical results for the problem that you're actually solving for another consideration in building um resiliency 
for Haiti, that would be uh, another consideration when building a resilient nation and a resilient city, as far as uh, this conversation is concerned, is to develop more responsive governance structures. Uh, one of the things that we are lacking and that needs to be put in place uh, uh, in order to become effectively resilient is the, the, the process of transferring powers. Uh, in Haiti, we tend not to know if something happens, who is the next in kin uh, is, and, 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 and that person has not been trained to take over and start uh, governing as if uh, uh, it happened to be the first person. So the, 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 the transfer of, of, of power, of functions, so you have to have backups uh, of functions, people that can play the role of another person, um, so that uh, that's a form of resiliency. The resources <laughs> need to be backed up as well, and responsibilities uh, from central government to multiple governing bodies. See, um, because they interact with a specific policy um, to be in a you know, useful way to achieve collective action because you, you don't want to be caught in uh, people not knowing or not having the proper authority because something happened and you don't have sort of the central government uh, being involved. So in a municipality of sort, uh, uh, the such municipality, uh, you know, a, a, a major event can occur uh, in a city and, and central government would not necessarily have had uh, the chance to react. Uh, so somehow at the municipality level, um, they have to be able to react just as much as an executive branch uh, is, uh, is acting. That's a, a, an important consideration because the chain of command is extremely important. That's why sometimes in, in the army or the defense community, you find that um, you know, something may happen uh, to the you know, general commander of sort, but you see that the next in command will act exactly as if uh, that first uh, level of command was present. So it's, it's extremely important to be able to delegate power and for that uh, 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 person to be able to conduct power um, once uh, to execute. Another consideration, again, in the world of resiliency is coordination. Uh, and really, uh, you know, defense institutions have a tendency to really have resiliency at the core of their structure. So coordination, cooperation, collaboration uh, are elements uh, to be considered in building um, uh, 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 resiliency. Uh, for example, uh, you can involve the co cooperative action, setting priorities that are endorsed by multiple stakeholders, meaning uh, the public institutions, the NGOs, the private sector. When you are building uh, uh, resiliency, every individual is involved in the process of resiliency. It's not somebody's job to uh, be resilient. Uh, it's everybody's job. <laughs> yeah. Meaning something could happen and all of a sudden you see somebody looking at what's going on as if that's not my job. No, <laughs> resiliency is not built around that's not my job. You mean it's not the president's job to be resilient? You mean we have to be resilient, participating as members of the resiliency plan as well? <laughs> well, you know, it sounds funny, but, it, you know, everyone needs to play its role, yeah. participate, collaborate, yeah. cooperate, uh, and even go uh, above and beyond the call of duty. 
So it's it's a, it's a doctrine of sort. Resiliency is a form of doctrine. Form of doctrine. And I think when I when I think about what country does that really well, I think about Germany. They are so process oriented. They are so ready to mitigate risk. Like I I think about the last World Cup and how they played and how they described how they built their teams. They have been training these young soccer players since the age of four years old to become World Cup players. So for them, the idea of resiliency is really embodied, indoctrinated in all aspects of their society. And they have mastered this sense of creating processes and becoming efficient and bouncing back even after a world war. It took them a very short period to build back, bounce back, and become a world leader. They did not just stay in the wreckage of the war and continue to slowly rebuild. They rebuilt and became a world power as a result. Yes, Germany is the epitome of resiliency. <laughs> but the last, um, I, I would say, it's not the last, but one other consideration I would uh, put into the resiliency uh, framework, could we say, is diversity. See, resiliency, it, it, when you create diversity in a system, uh, you, you, you end up having different components or different elements and different roles being able to be played within that resiliency. So it's not a one path system, but it's composed of several components, and that makes up of a very resilient system. So the, the presence of many elements, it, it compensates for the loss or failure of others. So there is always a backup. And I think just in general, in the world of innovation, there is no innovation without diversity. Innovation cannot exist in a homogeneous environment. It has to be diversified. And I think we see that a lot today with some of the most innovative companies having a diverse workforce, having a diverse set of skill set having a diverse set of perspectives. So the idea of diversity is really just having uh, a balance of approaches, perspectives, talents, skill sets that are feeding into this system that can be resilient and bounce back in any situation. So this was a very interesting episode to talk about, well, really to, to check ourselves. Let's check ourselves. Are we resilient? Is, is what the world is saying about Haiti, a poor country that has been, that has succumbed so many disasters, man-made and human-made, that we are so resilient because look at us continuing to survive. But this concept of resilience is actually misplaced and misdefined. And so what we've done in this episode is redefine resiliency based on what it actually means and talking about how do we build a best case scenario by having a resiliency plan. So in the next episode, we'll touch on what could Haiti look like in a best case scenario with the starting point of having a resiliency plan.